right. We're here with Bud Jeffries. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> we're uh, super excited to chat to you. And um, we recently had um, a gentleman on, Keegan Smith. And uh, he's a super knowledgeable guy and a, actually a real leader in his field. And he had mentioned you a few times. And, um, and then obviously, Gareth and I started to check you out. And been, uh, ever since, we've been enthralled by your Instagram and your message. And uh, so it's, it's been a real epic uh, journey. Thanks, thanks to Keegan. Oh, cool. Well, and Keegan's a, good, Keegan's a good man. Keegan's a good dude. And he's very smart, very knowledgeable, trains very hard, and does some really awesome stuff with people too. So... And again, like kind of like the whole idea of this podcast, it's more than just training, more than just, yeah. uh, you know, Keegan's got does some life building stuff too, so which is awesome. And he's a good, good guy. I always enjoyed working with him. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was, he was a great guy, definitely. And um, yeah, like we said to you just before we started the podcast, uh, it's so cool that uh, we can speak to someone with the name of Bud because <laughs> being South African, <laughs> We just call almost everyone bud. So like now it's like, oh, it's okay, you know. And uh, I was right. uh, I was chatting to my my girlfriend um yesterday, and I was like, I know what the name of our son is going to be. Like it's bud. Like that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, that's really funny. Funny. <laughs> So, bud, um, a mindset and a strength like yours takes a long time to cultivate. So. Let's take it back to the early days and uh, what did the young bud get up to day to day? <laughs> uh, well, up until about five years old, I guess the young bud had a, a very normal life. Um, but uh, even at the start, so there's research now that talks about babies who have to struggle to survive. It changes their, their, their attitude and their mindset as life and as people. So uh, I know you guys had kind of looked me up a little bit and found out some of the stuff about my mom and my mom had tried to have children for 12 years and they mm -hmm. told her she'd never have a baby. And when I was about to be born, uh, literally my heart dropped off a fetal monitor and they told her I was gone and I'm born like literally 19 minutes after the fetal monitor stopped. Hmm. And it, like, it was so close. They had to do an emergency C-section. It was so close. She told me she could feel the betadine being put on her skin like seconds before they cut her to, to bring me out. So there's, there's probably quite a bit involved in that. I, I think those things are, are, um, you know, foundational and, but I had an amazing, I had an amazing childhood. I had an amazing childhood for, for that reason, because my parents wanted children for so long and didn't have them. And all of a sudden they did have one and they thought it was a huge blessing and they were committed to that one way or the other. And, and it, it, in, in being born, doctors told my told them long time during the pregnancy that I wouldn't survive, that I'd be born blind or deaf, or that there was all kind of problems, and I wasn't. And they they but they had committed one way or the other to to taking care of me and my sisters that that I had laid that they had later, mm -hmm. no matter what happened with us. And so their their attitude toward us was really kind of a foundational thing. Um, and then I had this car accident at five years old, where uh, I I ran in front of a van and uh, I should never have survived it. It crushed my hip and fractured my skull and put me in a body cast, for, put me in the hospital for over a month and put me in a body cast for over three months and had all this stuff happen to me and all these corticosteroids and all this crazy stuff. And this is yet again in the seventies when, you know, rehab was sort of, a, well, it really wasn't anything at all. <laughs> and uh, I, I think there are some foundational things that might have been a blessing about that because my mom started me in martial arts so basically right after that. Um, because I had these physical deficits. I mean, they cut that cast off me and stood me up and I collapsed. I couldn't, I could not even, I could not stand at all, which is not necessarily that unusual after that, that's four solid months of no movement, four hmm. or five, actually, you know, at least four. And, but as a, as a kid, I, I became fascinated. My dad was this big, strong guy. And, and I, I, I was fascinated with human ability, with human strength. When I got, I got to kind of around that martial arts thing and got to see people do some kind of cool stuff and amazing stuff. And, and I don't know, <laughs> I've been discussing this a lot with my wife recently. If I don't know if I had some, some blessing head injuries as a child, <laughs> um, meaning it, you know, oftentimes, I mean, I had a massive concussion as a, as a, a little kid. And then I had another one as a 17 year old, I did massive, serious concussions. And I'm not sure that it didn't shut off the part of my brain that wants to say no. <laughs> um, that wants to 
you know, humans as they're trained as, as hum, uh, you're trained to either want risk or to avoid it. And the part of my brain that says avoid it doesn't really have a voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't know how much of that is, is, is conditioning as a human being or just, you know, blows to the head or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, <Yeah. laughs> you know, I had a very normal childhood as a kid until that time. And that piqued my interest in, in physical things. And, and, uh, so I, I've always had this thing, always had that mindset a little bit and it just began to develop and everybody I was around, it, you know, you, my parents were the people who would tell you, you could do anything, you could be anything. And I was around these martial arts teachers who expected you to work and expected you to do, a, you know, there, there was never a thought that says you can't do this. You shouldn't be able to do this. You're, um, you know, Oh, well, you're, you know, you, you've had this accident. You're not going to be able to no, That was never, Nobody ever, ever, ever said that. And so that began to develop me as a, a different things. And I guess I got such an early exposure to that and a want to like, I, okay, I, my mom has pictures of me when I was 10 going to going as uh, the Incredible Hulk for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? That kind of, a, so I've always had this sort of peaked interest and in all, all of my favorite childhood superheroes are, are, are must as Tarzan and, and the Hulk and, you know, that kind of um, physical human yeah. and, and that kind of, and really, I, I was thinking about this before this podcast and in kind of reviewing things we had, you know, we kind of emailed back and forth a little bit about and that maybe the, we're most big, strong guys won't really tell you that necessarily, but the truth is they had some comic book hero as a kid that, that <laughs> was their inspiration to be whatever. And maybe that's the modern mythology and the, and that mythology is actually, what we desire to be at a deeper level, mm, uh, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And I just maybe had the part of my head that says you can't be a comic book, uh, a figurature of yourself. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I, I went to school. I did the same things everybody else did. Like I went to school, school, went outside and played. I had a lot of outside time as a kid. I had that kind of upbringing where, you know, I lived on this little, um, my parents live on land that have been in my family for 150 years and it's just farm that my grandparent father had and we worked on trees and citrus and and uh, I played with I had a bunch of older cousins I used to go out I was 10 years old and I used to play football with the 15 year old boys and try to kill each other in the front yard and throw lawn <laughs> darts at each other and all kind of crazy stuff and, you know the, the rugged outside upbringing that a, that a boy should have that, a, yeah. that people should have that, that is developmental I believe and um uh, so and I went along to school and got into powerlifting and football kind of about the same time. And that sort of changed my mindsets as well and began to just build and build and build into, I guess, you know, all of life is the building block of what you are at the moment. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. That's where those things started for me. And, and maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, um, the recovery from your accidents. I mean, like four months in a cast is pretty hectic. How, how did you, how did you deal with it? First of all, do you remember it all? Like as a kid, was it a struggle? You no, know, I had spotty memories because the, the concussion was so intense. Um, I, I don't, I have, I have flashes of memory of things. Mm. Some of which I, I think is a legitimate flash in my head. And some of which is the things that my parents just sort of told me mm. was happening. Um, I really don't remember much as far as rehab. I, I honestly think I almost had like a, like a baby level restart as far as walking. I, I do know this now, this was the early seventies and like they took me home and they, they actually moved a bed out in our house into the front, front into the living room area of the house because that way, because people were coming to see me and, and they knew my, you know, that whole thing. Also it was the only house in the, in the, only room in the house that had a low enough window for to lay on a bed and see out uh, oh, cool. there really wasn't much you could do because I'm, I'm literally when i say as a body cast i literally had a cast from my chest all the way to my feet wow no, no movement at all wow for yes. months at a time and Good the Lord. one thing i did do and now this is kind of my mom tells this story and <laughs> i i used to uh so i don't know if you, i don't know if you guys remember and i have not you guys aren't probably neither one of you is old enough to remember this but uh, uh, but i'm sure you've seen it okay uh, the late 70s they had this the shag carpet you know what that is yeah 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 that looks like hair looks like you know hair coming yeah. out of you know that kind of thing so i guess i you know i was four i was almost wasn't even quite five years old so i'd get scared and whatever at night or whatever i'd pull myself off the bed in that cast and the cast weighed about as much as i did and i would grab that 
that that uh, that rug by because I could grip it because it, it had like hair you could grab, <laughs> and I would pull myself around oh. the house, and, like literally oh, wow. pull myself. I would pull myself down to my parents' bedroom. <laughs> no ways. Wake them up, and and they and my dad would pick me up and put me in the bed with them, and and you know that kind of thing. My mom said I wore the cast out four times. They had to wow. take me back to the doctor and have it recasted. Wow, you just weren't having it. Uh, well, it, dude, three it, it set late seventies. There was no, there. That's that's the three channels on TV time. There's uh, nothing. So oh, yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> summer in Florida, which is hot, which is oh. basically in a cast oh. all the time, and oh. then. I'm five. I got no mobility. I got, you know, there's no social media. There's nothing at that time. Yeah. So it's basically my mom, you know, read me stories. And I'm actually, now that was an awesome thing is my mom had, you know, enough community with people, especially from church where people would come and read, you know, like they, she has pictures of people coming and sitting with me to read me stories, uh -huh. things that you were, you would do with a small child that way. And to keep me, you know, some level of company, because you want to talk about stir crazy. My they, they <laughs> talked about me just being a terror in the hospital about just starting to get bored and losing my mind and just, wow, you know, um, it, it, the rehab thing, I really don't have much memory of. I know they sent her home. They said, you know, your skin's messed up after being in a cast that long. They sent her home with a bottle of like glycerin lotion and said, all right, move his legs around <laughs> in the bathtub. And that's pretty much it. There, there was just nothing. So anything that happened, my mother did. And then uh, evidently I had enough physical deficit or, or, or she maybe just thought it was a thing. And she literally just ran into this guy who was a Taekwondo teacher an old, old school, like he actually taught in the Korean army, old school, <laughs> um, uh, Taekwondo guy. And he had a school here in, in the town that I live in. And I was in that for three, four years after that. And, and, but it, it actually was a huge blessing in that, you know, most people, from a martial arts standpoint, aren't really enthused with Taekwondo, but this is a little different. This guy's a little very old school. And, but the, the flexibility work, the constant work on coordination, the constant work on paying attention and discipline and focus. And he was really, really into those, you know, kind of things were huge. And that was probably the biggest, biggest rehab stuff. And actually that probably influenced my thoughts on rehab and helping other people today in the, in the couple of people that I've been able to, you know, the few people that I've been able to help hmm. with that is I think rehab for a lot of people needs to be addressed in a very gross motor movement way mm. versus most rehab is set up as a finite motor movement thing. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. They'll have you do little tiny exercises where you do, you know, all right, lift your toes this way, that way, lift your toes. This. And not that you don't need to do that and that's fine or whatever, but like if you need to walk, you need to try to walk. Mm -hmm. If you need to be able to stand up out of a chair, you need to try to stand up out of a chair, not just flex your leg three times the other way and flex it that way or whatever. Like, and also maybe a little bit on the aggression level of rehab uh, in that, in the people that I've had, like, okay, as an example of that, maybe 15 years ago before my father passed away, he had a stroke and uh, he was par not paralyzed, but he was paralyzed on one side for a short period of time. And then, and then he was able to move, but he had to do the rehab. Well, I moved into his house for a month and basically lived with him and said, you're, we're going to walk again one way or the other. I don't care what we have to, you know, you can hate me. It doesn't matter. We have to do this. You have to stand up. You have to do these things. And they had therapists come and not that they're not nice people and doing their job and doing that whole thing, but the, the, the getting back to reality of life after that kind of a thing, it can really be a thing. That's not a, you know, most, a lot of therapy, unfortunately, is set just to get you back to the basics of movement, not to truly make you a functional, functional human being. And the thing is, you can come back from just about anything if you really are willing to do what it takes, but that may not be easy or pleasant or, or that's just the reality of it. It, it. You know, if you're paralyzed on one side, it's a huge effort just to stand up out of a chair. And you may have to have somebody like me who says, I'm going to pick you up we're going to make this motion. We're going to do this one way or the other. Mm. And we're going to make this happen because sometimes in, especially in those injuries, things the human body has the capacity to rebuild, but it has to be forced. It doesn't just happen. It has to be made to, to work. And mm. I think those things maybe were shaping to me in that particular moment. And then just sort of opened my mind to, you know, okay, well, I, I didn't have any other influence to say you can't do this. And I didn't have any other influence to yeah. say, why can't you do a, you know, you're a little kid and you couldn't walk six months ago, but now you're doing a full split and doing high kicks and jump kicks. And <laughs> why? Because the guy said, let's do this. And yeah. okay. 
There was no, yeah. you know, um, I just think that mindset of possibility, mm. no matter what possibility, whether you're coming from a normal place or possibility, whether you're coming from a need for rehab or a deficit or possibility, whether you're, um, want to be something more than, than you are, or maybe, maybe the absolute top end potential of what you have. Maybe that's the, the thing that really opened out of that. Um, yeah. And that, that therapeutically, it was just my mom, man. Yeah, that's it. That, to answer that wow. question in a simpler way, it, dude, that was me in the bathtub and her taking my leg and going, all right, let's move. And I'm like, let's move this thing. Wrong. <laughs> you know? And you didn't, and they were, they weren't all these limiting beliefs on imposed on you. No, and that's probably yeah. the bless. That's probably maybe one of the biggest blessings of my life. They, they used to talk about, I don't know if you guys know the name, Paul Anderson. Paul okay. Anderson was a 1956 American uh, Olympic champion, Olympic weightlifting champion. And I'm physically built like him. I, I, a lot of my old strongman show was based around, around a lot of his stuff. Um, a lot of similarities and that kind of thing. But they used to talk about, like, he came out of nowhere, out of the backwoods of Georgia, came out of nowhere and just, like, by 100 pounds, destroyed the world press record at the time. Okay. Wow. And, like, he was the first guy to really push squats as a, a strength thing and he was when everybody else was when the heaviest squats in the world and powerlifting was just starting and the world records were 600 and 700 pounds he was doing 800 per sets of 10 that kind of thing he was doing he was just a monster <laughs> monster strong he's literally still today considered one of the strongest humans to ever have lived but they used to say about him he he trained in such a secluded place and he had such little emphasis a, a little exposure to the other people that he just didn't know he wasn't able wasn't supposed to be able to do that yeah <laughs> it, you know, he didn't know that the the wow. record press in the world at the time was 350 and he walked over and like on his first attempt pressed 400 and they wow. they were like he just didn't know that he wasn't supposed to be able to do that he was 50 to 100 pounds ahead of everybody on the planet wow that's okay time, you know um, and, and, and maybe and, that's the thing that that no exposure to you can't yeah exactly yeah so powerful that eh? <laughs> we don't we we you don't realize how how powerful good positive words are but you also don't always think about how negative negative words are now how, how, what, what an impact that can have and, and actually it's hard to kind of imagine but you'd mentioned that you were almost were a little bit bullied uh, for a time up until sort of the age of more or less 14 but what actually changed in you well okay so that came about out of that car accident all right so i went into this body cast as a thin normal looking little kid and i it was like i woke up in a completely different body so like i haven't even seen my own body for four to five months because i've been wrapped in stuff and covered in casts or whatever well they cut me out of this cast and i woke up as a fat kid mm -hmm. at a time when nobody was talking about bullying and people were you know and so the first thing in the world out of, out of a lot of kids mouth is that kind of thing it's that kind of mm. you know that kind of stuff and I'm at the time not prepared necessarily to deal with that. No more than any kid is no more than any kid is, is ready to, you know, to deal with that kind of mental situation. And, and the reality of life is that, that, that exists and it always will exist and it's a human behavior and it's, it's unfortunate and horrible. And it, and it obviously, and honestly, it created this huge chip on my shoulder, not so much about me, but about watching other people because see that what I went through prepared me to have a completely different mindset about how I look at human beings and their value and their beauty. Mm. And, but most people are conditioned to judge people by whether they're, whether they look a certain way, whether they're thin enough, whether they're this, whether they're that or whatever. I don't care. I don't really, I honestly don't care. None of that means anything. What your internal value is, is an entirely different thing. And your internal mm. value has to do with your creation and you're the, the, the universe and God or however you want to describe it, creating you into, into the, the, the being that you're supposed to be and we're not supposed to be the same as anybody else period mm -hmm. and so I went through that in that I went to school and then it, it was older kids who just like to pick on little kids and that kind of thing because they're taught to be vicious as humans instead of kind as humans mm -hmm. and they're taught that it's okay to to hurt people instead of uh, when it should be okay to protect people the reality of what that should be and you know I I, I went through that as a kid because I I literally just I literally almost like woke up with a totally different, it's like I went to sleep and then I was a different human being <laughs> when I woke up. And then about 13, 14, uh, a, a friend who I'd gone to school with called me and said, 
hey, I'm, I changed schools, and this little private school we're going to is going to start a football team, and I'd like you to, why don't you come play with us? And I was like, okay. And I really, never really even paid attention to football before that and went and played the first year of football, and, and they, that led me basically directly to powerlifting. And I all of a sudden had the sense of power of a human being that changed the way I dealt with the world. So now it really doesn't matter if you're older than me or even bigger than me or, or if you're, you know, and I learned to be verbally, uh, not so much aggressive, but just aggressive as a, only in the way that necessary to protect yourself from those kind of things. Mm. And I, all of a sudden, now you really kind of can't pick on me <laughs> because I won't allow it. So, and, and the, so and the whole to thing to that it did is gave me this massive empathy for how people are treated. Mm. Okay. Uh, because a lot of people who that happens to, it, it turns them into a bully or it makes the, in other words, people who are, you know, who are, who were picked on and viciously, whatever spoken to or whatever, that's how they react. They just do that. Just so they pass that along. They do it to somebody else. Well, the influence of my parents and the church and God and, and the influence of, of having been through that and then being taught my whole life that your job as a man is to protect those around you gave me this entirely different mindset about that. And then I began to see what it really did to people. I began to see what it really did, especially, and I have an even huger, bigger chip on my shoulder about this, about women, because almost every woman on this planet struggles with body image issues, whether she's the thinnest woman, you know, or the most perfect looking woman, you know, or the biggest woman, you know, and People feel ridiculously free to say incredibly ugly things to them and do this mm. massive amount of damage that they have no idea. And they walk away from it like they never did a thing in the world to somebody. And those people walk around carrying issues for lifetimes off sometimes mm -hmm. out of stuff like that. So and I true. think it's our job to stop that. I think yeah. it's our job to, to protect people in that way. I think it's our job never to make that okay and to call people out on it. I don't, I don't believe in – you know, because I, I get a lot of guff from people because I, I talk about this regularly in, in some of the things I write about. And they're like, why don't you just ignore those haters? I'll tell you why I don't ignore them. Because ignoring people doesn't make them understand that what they did hurt people. Hmm. And I don't ignore it because there is somebody out there. All right. You can, I don't care what you say to me. I've been through this enough that you, you can say anything in the world to me. And, I, I, you know, I'm, you might get a reaction, but you're not going to hurt me. But I mm. watch people every day be hurt by those things. Yeah. And somebody needs to tell those people that, number one, you don't have to be hurt by these people. Number one, they're not right. They cannot damage or change your value. They cannot make anything like that. They're just somebody who is not doesn't know the difference between what they're doing. Or there's somebody who whatever happened to them made them a vicious human being and they hurt other people. And that's, you know what, that's just reality of life. But we can be better. And we have the responsibility to be better, no matter what that responsibility looks like, because it's a wonderful thing to say, hey, let's ignore this and it'll go away. And that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you got to step up and maybe be the maybe be the voice in the room, regardless of whether it's nice or popular, that says, hey, you are not going to speak to people like that in my hmm. presence, one way or the other. You're just not going. Yeah, yeah. I, love it. I love that, but that's so good. And then. What you just said now with me really resonated uh, about just having a different outlook on life and on people uh, because I was in a serious motorbike accident when I was 16 and it, and it also like it totally changed my perception on on people and the world and life and stuff and I I'm the same like I'm always looking for the good in people and I can't understand it when other people are, are looking for something bad you know what I mean like right. uh, and they're always doing that in the first instance. It's like, no, hang on, don't don't do that. There's no point in doing mm -hmm. that. So right. what you're saying and the message you're spreading is super powerful and, and definitely, especially now these days with social media, it's really needed, you know, and we do need to oh, stand absolutely. up to these bullies and and call them out. And um, yeah, because at the end of the day, it's often their own insecurities, which they just, that's why they're doing it, you know. Right. So, so yeah, yeah. So, 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 but maybe you can like, Tell us a little bit about, you know, you mentioned powerlifting, but then you got into strongman. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and doing the shows and what like consisted of a show? Like what is a typical show like? Right. Right. Okay. Well, I got into powerlifting because of football and then, uh, I don't know, you know, your listeners may be a little different vein than the most of the people who normally listen to me. So there's different 
types of strength sports, that kind of thing that makes a difference. So powerlifting is one particular strength sport. I competed in that. I got, I got really good at that. And it, and it really gave me, you know, I don't want to say self-esteem, but it definitely gave me a sense of accomplishment in that. And that's a big deal that it, it, making yourself actually do something, you know, um, and, uh, and, and I'll finding the things that are, are special to you. So I don't care if you're strong. I don't care for whatever. I don't care what your deal is. You as a human being have something you can be talented at. If you just simply put in the work, if you get around the right people, if you do the right thing, it, it doesn't make a difference because so many people are walking around this planet thinking they, they're not good at anything. They're just whatever. That's not true. You can be amazing at something. You, something. I don't yeah. know what it is. Could be the different <laughs> thing for you, uh, whatever it might be. You might be the best Australian podcasters in the world. That could be the whole thing. That could be your whole, you know, whatever it is. You can do something. And that. so I got into this powerlifting thing and, and I, I went from there and kind of powerlifted most of the year and then played football the other parts of the year and went to the college and went into college. And when I was there, uh, I went to this little church and this guy asked me to do a promo for a guy who was probably one of the best powerlifters of all time. And certainly at that moment in the world, a guy named Anthony Clark, who was um, first guy to bench press 800 pounds and first guy, he was just an, and this, an, this kind of wild guy, an amazing little guy. And he toured with a prison ministry company that they would and that they this is a cool thing they they would come and set up at a church for like a week and they would have a they would go to every prison they could drive to during the day and then they would have a crusade thing or there were meetings at night or whatever but what this guy did was he picked he got people who were amazing at something and he had would bring six or seven people and they were all the best in the world that the when the guy when anthony came he was the best powerlifter or one of the best strongmen in the world uh, it brought the women's world basketball handling championship. Who was this like little five foot two lady who could spin like 12 basketballs at the same time. <laughs> wow. That kind of, you know what I'm saying? They, they brought a guy who had actually been a jewel thief. <laughs> wow. And, and uh, yeah, they brought another guy who, um, they actually brought the guy who was the card sharp who the, there's an American movie that Robert Red Robert Redford was in called the sting. They brought the oh. guy who that movie was made up. They, that movie. No was ways. Made, and that guy, it was, so it was a wild thing or whatever, but this guy asked me, like, listen, we got this little local cable TV show, and, and uh, I know you do some of the same things this guy does, and I, we want to get people excited about them coming. Would you do something to, to do that? So I'm like, okay, sure. And I find – okay, this is pre-internet, okay? So there is, it is, you can't just Google what there is. To do. I'm, like, desperately looking at, like, libraries and trying to call people and – like had some old powerlifting USA magazines that had like the occasional picture reprinted of something like from a hundred years ago. <laughs> I kind of figure out what some of the old time strongmen did. And then I, I put this little thing together and, and that's the first time I ever did it, but it opened my eyes to what I wanted to do in life. And I enjoy the thing that maybe the, one of the things that most people don't really enjoy, which is public speaking or which is just, you know, um, doing that kind of thing. And, and I had this talent for strength and I had this, and I had the ability to maybe share some things in my life that were kind of amazing that, that I shouldn't be, you know, I shouldn't, be. if you look at most people, I should never have survived my birth. I should never have survived the car accident I had at five. I had another one at 17 that should have broken my neck and killed me. And then there's no, how in the world it didn't is only divine intervention. Um, yet I've been able to do things that very few humans have been able to do, even though I shouldn't even be walking. Hmm. and and you can do that and here's the thing it, that what i want people to see out of that is that i'm i want to live my life trying to be the complete fulfillment of the potential of a human being of the most extraordinary i can possibly be but in being that it's not that i'm extraordinary it's that human beings can be extraordinary and you can be just as extraordinary at anything you want to be you just have to do the right thing it's not like hmm. a you know, um, I'm so ridiculously special that it just happened that way. No. Okay. You could do, you could do whatever you could do. You, if you just have to do the things to fulfill your potential. So mm. he opened my eyes to this thing and I do, and I, I, I do like 10 minutes tops might've been like seven was talking <laughs> way too fast was, you know, was the first, I was an 18 year old <laughs> kid doing this first real public stuff. But wow. then I, I see that, you know what, people made a living doing this. And people, uh, especially 100 years ago, when in the vaudeville era, when there was nothing but live shows and people did that. Mm. So I start to kind of hone that craft. And, I, and I, anywhere I can, they let me do it, I'll do it. And later on, I become a real 
I really actually do do it for a living and kind of become a prof- I become literally a professional old time strongman. I made a living doing that. <laughs> now some of that today is split on you know internet and and then live shows. But you asked about what a live show is. So for me, most of the time, what people don't really understand is that most of the people who hire me as a show are actually looking for a speaker who does strong stuff. They're not looking for a strong man who doesn't have the ability to speak to a crowd, doesn't have a story mm. who doesn't, or doesn't want to educate on a particular thing. So mm. a lot of the, the stuff that I did was based around bullying, anti-bullying shows for schools. So what they're looking for is me to come in and educate these kids and the strength feats are really more of a, let's keep your attention. Let's get your attention. Let's open your mind. Let's do some things that, and, and kids are talked at all day, all the time, but it's kind of a, an eye opening thing when a guy who's a little bigger than anybody, most people you've ever seen walks in. And the first thing he does is grabs one of your teachers and lifts them overhead with one hand. <laughs> kind of opens their idea to let's listen. Maybe yeah. I should listen to this guy. Cause number one, he's wow. And number two, maybe he's got something to say. Yeah. And, and so uh, for most of the shows actually flesh out a little different than most people would think because they, most of the shows run about 45 minutes and most of it is me speaking and it's talking about different issues and telling a story about telling my life story and telling what happened to me and how, how it affects you and what you can be about. And, and, and uh, mixed into that, because I, what I found is that humans, especially kids, um, uh, attention spans are only so long. So I'll walk in, introduce myself, do a couple of feats of strength because that really makes them pay attention instead of just somebody speaking verbally. And then we'll, after I do a couple of feats, we'll talk for 10 or 12 minutes and then we'll do a couple more feats and then we'll talk for 10 or 12 minutes and do a couple more feats Mm. and then we'll finish with a feat or two and just sort of wrap things up at the end because that's about as far as you can go, no matter how interesting you are. (laughs) For people to actually yeah. listen, you know, and unless you're like, now this is a different situation, obviously, because people are purposely tuning in to listen and they're adults and that's the whole thing. But actually even adults are pretty lame in their attention yeah. span. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I'll do, you know, one of the things I found is the whole point of being an old time strong man is doing feats that make people understand strength. And, and more than that, it has to be something that they kind of can't miss, if that makes sense. Mm. So like doing a feat that, I'll give you an example. I have friends who can bend pennies with their fingers. Wow. Okay. You and I, because we're enough into the physical thing, get that. The average yeah. person doesn't get the magnitude of that feat. It's a phenomenal feat. <laughs> strength. Phenomenal. But it's tiny. And yeah. it's hard to see. And yeah. they're like, oh, it's a penny. It doesn't, you know. Now, the reality yeah. is you can drive a car over a penny and not bend it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. Bending it with your fingers is kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but don't get that. So, and also feats in, a, in an old time strongman way kind of have to match the guy, if that makes sense. So, all right, I'm almost six foot tall and 290 or so pounds. So I'm a fairly big human being, not really mm-hmm. compared to some of the giants that are my friends, but it, I'm, I'm a <laughs> fairly big human being. So if I walk in and do a really tiny little feat, it doesn't make, yeah. it doesn't look it doesn't capture the imagination. It doesn't translate into the visual that people need. It doesn't. But if I pick another human being up and lift them overhead with one hand, you, you can't miss it. You can't yeah. You yeah. see what I mean? Like well, the challenge of being a strong man in, in a public show way is doing things that people can understand and, and are simplified or explained to the point that they cannot miss yes. how mm. strong it is versus that, like the reason I would lift a human versus a barbell is because I can walk in with a barbell and I can put 300 pounds on that barbell or 800 pounds on that barbell, depending on the kind of plates I used and loaded it. Mm. And the average kid and slot of the average adults won't really understand the difference. But if I yeah. go in and, and stick uh, eight people, eight humans on a plank and pick them up at the same time, <laughs> uh, you can't miss it. You know what I'm saying? You can't yeah. the, you can't. Um, which is kind of the difference. Now, a lot of the modern strongman competition, because after I got into powerlifting, I did strongman competition, then I did Highland Games, and I did the ultimate fighting for a while, then I did um, yeah, anything crazy you could. If it's heavy and stupid, I've tried it. <laughs> and, and, but a lot of those things actually are come from their descent. So modern powerlifting is a descendant of the old-time strongman. Modern strongman competition, most of the feats are descendant from that era where people were doing those kind of things. And a lot of mm. them are, 
are from, you know, from legendary stories of that kind of thing, or from even from mm. antiquity from, you know, um, all of that is sort of descended and mixed together. And, and the era that I sort of embrace really and come from is really more than what they call physical culture, which was about being strong at and, and, and vital at everything, not just being mm. kind of a specialist, which is sort of where I've gone with that whole thing, kind of an anti-specialist. I want to be good at everything, but I don't want to really defi- be defined. I want to be defined by what I want, not what somebody else's idea of what is okay is. I love that. I think it's so, it's so smart to, to bring the kids in with that. And they, it, it's also a lot deeper than that. It's also like, here's this guy who's, um, who, who can articulate himself, but can also like break stuff, you know, like whatever <laughs> it is, like bend stuff and lift people, yeah. but he can actually still have a moment of being um, the softer side, the gentle side and, and, and talking about caring for others and I think that must be a massive like eye opener for some of the kids. Um, you know, you, you can be this strong and, and a real inspirational guy without being an aggressive, horrible person. Like I'm sure a lot of the, you know, so I think it's, it's, well, and it's, smart, a, and it's but- an anti stereotyping. Okay. Because mm-hmm. most people are conditioned We're and this is the, this is actually one of the dumbest things. You're conditioned to look at a man like me and see a muscle head or an aggressive mm. person. You're conditioned that just because I'm large and muscular, I'm aggressive, or yeah. I'm not. In, I'm not intellectual. Like literally, yeah. that if you look at those two stereotypes, those are big things, and that's yeah. totally wrong. In fact, if you meet most of the strongest guys on the planet, and I'm not talking about the middle guys. I'm talking about the top one percent. A lot of them are actually much smarter than you think yeah. because getting to that level mm. is problem solving for years and years and years and mm. years. That's what that training is. That's I want to de- I'm deadlifting 800 pounds. Now I want to deadlift 900 pounds. What are the problems I have to solve to make that extra hundred pounds? And it's 20 years of building to that level. And it's a thinking all the time about how to make yourself and other things better. They're, they may not be, you know, terribly articulate about you know french culture of the 1700s but (laughs) they uh, but they're a smart human being and and whatever level whatever kind of intelligence they possess but they do possess some significant intelligence and i don't believe that you're a complete human being or that you're just because you look a certain way does not make you a certain way Mm -hmm. simply uh, uh, and the flip side of that is true if you're what people would term as classically beautiful you may not be the nicest person that ever walked the planet exactly. either yeah and i do think that it, the, the stronger you are the more responsible you are to be gentle most of the time mm. um, yeah and and to to create that message okay to create like there is literally no reason most of us should not just be relatively gentle with each other basically all the time yeah, okay? yeah. just because i can or i have the ability to not be yeah. does not make it better for me to be unless now I, and I'm going to tell you this and then people might not like this idea, but I believe you ought to have both sides. You ought to have yeah. the ability to not be gentle when it is necessary. Yeah. But your default as a man, as a human ought to be being nice to people, being gentle. I think people who, most people who are not that way are just afraid. They're afraid mm-hmm. all the time. I think you should be strong enough that you can be nice, strong enough that you don't need to prove anything except how general you can be with people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so super cool. powerful, man. And then what you just said there as well, it's a couple of things actually, uh, when you talk about big guys and stuff and especially the current guys, and I know he's kind of not really doing it anymore, but like you look at Eddie Hall and he is, he's like, he always says big love and like, he's always very encouraging, yeah. like just like yourself, you know what I mean? And, and that's such a great thing to see. Um, you know, someone who's like, ridiculously strong and done so well well. i have found that with so i'm i'm an outsider a little bit in in all of the weightlifting world because i now i used to be a competitive powerlifter i've competed in some of everybody's everything but now i do so much of my own thing and it's outside of everybody's box it's not really Mm -hmm. anybody's box but most of the top guys know each other or know each other through friends or or know each other here and there. And what I have found is that the people who are vicious about things and the people who are unaccepting are the middle level people who are not really very good at, they're kind of okay, or they got a little bit of knowledge. The top end guys, people like Eddie um, and other people I've met who are like, okay, like Ed Cohen, who was the 
greatest powerlifters that ever walked the planet, and Louis Simmons, who's probably one of the greatest coaches that ever walked the planet, and and Chris Duffin, who's a monster. Uh, <laughs> respect mm. other people. Yeah. They don't need to prove they're the baddest guy in the room. They already know they're the baddest guy in the room. They don't need to try to force <laughs> that on other people. Yeah. And they don't, and they respect other people because they okay. I don't do what they do, but I respect what they do because I understand the lifetime of commitment it takes to get to the level that they're at, and they respect me in the same way. Yeah. And we, they, we don't, nobody needs to prove anything. Nobody needs to, you know, I don't need to prove I'm whatever, and I don't need to be better than you at this. You don't need to be better than me at that. I just need to be me. You need to be you, and let's be cool together, and let's have a good, let's be, and let's help other people get to that level. That's the whole yeah. idea about that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and You did speak up. Yeah. Sorry, man. You go, man. No, that, so the other thing was, it was so interesting what you said about like what people think of you based on how you look. I was literally reading something this afternoon on Insta. There's this guy, I'm not sure if you know of him. His name is, well, his, his handle is like Kubila Fitness and he's a um, guy based in Ghana um, okay. that, that just has his own like gym in this you know, little town that he lives in. And, he's, and he showed a video of this, of this other guy and he's like, this guy here, look at his body. He doesn't actually train, um, but he's in such great shape. And he, but he says the reason that he doesn't train in Ghana like, is because how they look, if, they, if they're big and muscly, they perceive to be criminals. Mm. So like mm. his parents won't even let, let him train in the gym. So he's like, yeah, it's just weird that you said that. And um, yeah. you know, that's how it's perceived in Ghana that uh, you know, you're a mm. criminal if you have a good big body. Wow. Well, and, and okay, I get that some, okay, I make a joke all the time that I look like a hell of angel, but, uh, <laughs> like, cause I kind of do, I'm a big guy with a beard and a biker look and I got tattoos everywhere and I just, I, I just kind of do. And it, it's odd to watch people's who have a, a truly ingrained perception. And I get why, because a lot of the people, okay, a lot of the people who look like me act like you would think they're like yeah. you're a stereotype to believe they're they are pushy toward people they are aggressive in a way that you know that's un, that's that's not necessary for whatever situation it is or that's not cool or that's and so i get where people have that stereotype to some extent but it's it's you it's weird to, to see the um to see the, the the real perceptions people have when you walk in a room and, and normally i'm kind of oblivious my wife you generally have to point this out to me because I'm, so, I'm sort of so focused on doing what I'm doing. When I walk through the room, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm not really noticing what you're doing. And, but it's funny how she walks, but like she's like, you should see that lady look at you like, Jesus Christ, she's going to kill us. So there's no, or, or like little kids would be like, oh my God, what are you, you know, and that kind of, or, or guys, now this is funny, guys will all of a sudden stand up and yeah, so stand up and get straight in. They'll, they'll try to, you know, they'll, or they'll try to puff their chest <laughs> out. And, yeah. Um, and, and what's, I'll tell you what's even funnier though. What's gratifying about this is I've had this happen a lot. So when I started doing, especially when I spoke in churches as a, a young guy, it was kind of a new thing, especially in the area where I was at. And they, people, and older women would be like, you know, I didn't think this was a, was a, was a proper thing to do here. But then I listened to you talk and I heard that it wasn't, that it, that it really was, that it really was not a, that there's more to this than just some knucklehead who picked up something heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's yeah. you know and that's a big thing that's a good, and i want people to have that perception and I, i'd like to do my best to destroy the, any perception of that that you're too big too little too fat too thin yeah. too pretty too not pretty to mm -hmm. look like a hell's angel to be anything to be you know you're just because i'm big doesn't mean i'm not smart doesn't mean yeah, i'm yeah. not not nice doesn't mean i'm not doesn't mean i ha don't have empathy doesn't mean i'm not you know, uh, we're just our conditioned by those stereotypes and we got to pay better attention to each other. And, and, and if you look like that stereotype, do your best not to be it. Yeah. 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 It's so cool that you can actually, actually defy that stereotype. There's something really quite um, gratifying, I'm sure for you to, to defy those stereotypes. But I just wanted to come back to the strongman stuff just briefly. Um, uh, it sounded like really hard. I don't think, you know, gave it any justice there, how hard, how much hard work it is to do what you're doing. And you did something like a thousand shows in, in a, in a, in a few years. And yeah. it must be really quite tough. You're talking about problem solving, um, to, to actually do those shows and give, give, give as much as you were, right. as you were. That is, 
a challenge and a half. Um, that made me extremely conscious of what it is to live like the old time guys did. So the guys who came out of the circus area uh, era and vaudeville era, you know, that's what they did. They lived on the road. They went from theater to theater, from place to place. They toured. And that's basically what I did. The way that the, mm. the tour that I worked with was set up, it's two shows a day, five days a week, nine months a year. Um, so I, in a three year period, I did over a thousand shows working nine full months out of each year and then home for a couple or whatever. And that got wow. now, and that's two physical shows as well as mental shows a day. Ooh. Um, that, which is quite a thing, which is quite a, and, and, and as much or more, the travel is a huge part of it because you're, now you're talking about different hotel every night. Uh, so it's not only is it going from show to show, it's going from place to place. Mm, yeah. And the, and it's the, and okay, you can't show up and say, I don't feel good today. So I'm gonna give you a subpar show. Yeah, mm, work that exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do, you know, and and you can't say, hey, I'm kind of jacked up because uh, I haven't seen my wife in three weeks or a month, and yeah. I'm a little upset, and uh, I, I can't give you a good show. Yeah. yeah. That kind of it doesn't you know, work that way. Uh, and my wife obviously did the best she could do. To, she did absolutely amazing to keep me you know, sane, which is really kind of a big deal because she basically – like whatever good is happening here, whatever, you know, saneness I happen to be communicating is basically based on her keeping me from burning down the local villages. That are near. <laughs> <laughs> because as much as I really do want to be like, you know, super peaceful, walk in with beads and the Dalai Lama, I also sort of walk in with a sword on the other side and <laughs> I just get tempted to take over small towns and that kind of thing. <laughs> so like she is that, that calming factor and force in, in my life. Um, it, it, it's it's quite a thing that is okay so six to eight strength feats twice a day five days a week hmm. um crazy. now when you're doing a show like that you're doing moderated feats okay i'm not bending the biggest hardest thing i can do yeah. everything every time but i'm doing it 12 times a week <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's kind of a you know there there is the balance back there and forth it taught me a lot about that it taught me a lot about um being ready to go all the time, being mm -hmm. ready to go mentally or physically or whatever all the time. Doesn't really matter if I had to drive a lot yesterday or I didn't sleep that great or whatever. You really actually can be at, at pretty close to peak performance pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to mentally gear yourself. You have to, you have to build to it, prep to it. You have to be physically prepared because that's one thing you don't talk about with that, but like, okay, so I do a 45 minute show. I have to be able to do a strength feat and go right back to talking. Mm. Okay? I can't do that strength feed and say, hang on, I need three minutes <laughs> to catch my breath. I gotta, you, we're not, there's no intermission in a show like that. It just is what it is. So you lose, you completely lose everything you just did if you do the most amazing feat in the world and you can't speak to them literally 10 seconds after it's done. Yeah, wow. Yeah. See what I mean? So yeah. you have to be in tremendous aerobic shape. Actually, the aerobic shape really helps you on the recovery standpoint from, you know, all right, I got a show in the morning. I, got, I might have, and, I, and some of those days, most of it was two shows. I've done four, five, six shows a day. Wow. Wow. It's it's on the, it's like some days book like that. It's double shows, double, you know, whatever. So it is what it is. Um, you really do need a massive physical background of that, but uh, it's, again, it's achievable. It's not, you know, um, and, it, and you're right. It is a lot of hard work, but you, you have to be versed in your subject enough to just be on it all the time mentally focused enough to just be able to turn it on, turn it off. And that's one of the big things I really learned about that is being able to focus energy, focus your mind and be able to go from, I just got out of the car to I'm ready to go. I can yeah. go with imme immediate focus. Not that like, all right, I need 20 minutes to get ready. No, I yeah. uh, let's go. I'm ready to go. There's yeah. no, you know, wow. you have to do that. And, but you learn to do that. You practice doing that all the time. You practice channeling your internal energy. You practice channel but by doing that. You're, by doing the thing itself, you're, you're practicing the thing. You're practicing mm -hmm. the other elements that people would practice individually while you're doing that over and over again. So you get used to using more physical, subtle energy. You get used to using, um, I mean, not that it becomes like a workman thing, but it does a little bit become like a workman thing. I mean, it's not like mm -hmm. laying bricks, but a little bit it is, okay? My brick yeah. laying happens to be that I lift people and that I, uh, you know, I, whatever. Um, and it really was a, a tremendous eye-opening experience um you get to the place where the giving the mental giving portion of it is as much or more difficult 
than any yeah. of the physical. Yeah. Um, because you have to be up for those shows. That's not a, you know, you don't, you, it's not a thing where, but you also understand that you build, like most people don't think about this, but what if you build your internal energy, you build your emotional energy, you build your ability, just like you build your lifts. Mm. Just yeah. like I, in other words, I used to be able to do a hundred of something. Now I can do a thousand of it without an issue. I used to be able to lift a hundred pounds. Now I can lift 500 pounds without an issue. Mm. I used to be able to speak once a day and be wrecked from it. And now I can speak six, six times a day and it doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Maybe you can build all of those things together. If you just learn how to focus them right and learn how to use those energies and learn how to do it in a way that um, balances with what the human body needs and what's yeah, necessary yeah. and what's and, and open your mind to what's possible there. It just is there. There's the possibilities are just so much bigger than you think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lovely. yeah. And, and but, uh, look, talking about uh, strength, I guess the ultimate strength test came when your son Noah passed away. And I can only imagine that it was incredibly hard for, you and your wife um but i guess in one of the one of the good things that came out of it is that you started something positive called noah's army uh, right. so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about um your son and about what happened and then about noah's army okay um that is by far the hardest thing that has ever happened in remotely in our lives my life period by a thousand percent there is no comparison and perspective change is beyond comprehension on what matters and what doesn't after something like that happens so doesn't does it matter how tired i am or what i did or what happened or what worked or the fact that you stubbed your toe today and you're having a bad day your coffee was cold no it doesn't what matters is the people you care about and what you do about them period I don't care what happened. I don't care if you lost your job, broke your leg, big freaking deal. Mm. All of those things heal. All of those things get past. All of those things mean nothing compared to what you do for the people you love. So, so let me tell you about my son. My son was born in under very similar circumstances to me, which is, this is a kind of a crazy thing. Okay. Mm. So five different doctors told my wife she'd never have a baby. Mm. She had uh, preeclampsia and her actual placenta detached hmm. days before he was born. And wow. he should never have survived. They, he spent five days in neonatal intensive care. Uh, they told us he wouldn't, he, he, they wanted to follow him. They think he didn't have, he'd have developmental problems. Not a single one. Now, at five years old, he had an accident. We were actually playing roughhousing and he jumped and hit me and bounced off and flipped and it broke his arm, hit, it, hit the ground and broke his arm. We took him to the doctor. They put him in a cast. Well, they gave him this drug as a sedative, and he had this massive reaction to it. Mm. And he was sick every day for six weeks, and he went from being a totally normal little five-year-old to a kid who couldn't even pick up a pencil. Mm. He couldn't remember an ABC, didn't know what it was. Wow. And had to start completely over again. And, and we went to two experts after this, and we found out one of two things, okay? That drug did one of two things, and there, there's no way to know for sure, but this is what happened. It either caused him to be dyslexic because it erased some of the pieces of his brain or it erased his memory prior to that. And what it, it erased was, so a lot of dyslexics, we found out basically right after that, that he was dyslexic. A lot of dyslexics are so good at coping that you, it takes forever to, to diagnose what it is because mm -hmm. they don't, they, they just adapt. They don't, mm -hmm. um, it takes forever to figure out why they're having a problem. Well, he never exhibited much of a problem before that. And all of a sudden it was really tremendous. And uh, so it either erased the barrier from left to right in his brain. And maybe it was both. Maybe it just erased his ability to cope or maybe, uh, maybe it caused that we don't have any idea. But so what happened after that is we took him out of school because he couldn't get any help for dyslexia. And they were such a problem about, I mean, he literally, it, that drug had such a reaction in his body. He was sick for six weeks. It was like he had DT, wow. like he was, he was coming off heroin or something oh. as a five-year-old. Like he literally, literally vomited every day for six weeks oh my God. from that. Yeah. So we took him home and, and my wife began to homeschool him. And, and also that was a time where I had been on to travel more, but it opened some doors for him. And he began to just do some absolutely amazing things. He got, 
ridiculously strong. He got, and, and so she did some things to help him with dyslexia. He began to go to music and that kind of thing. So he becomes this just literally phenomenal human being, better than I ever thought about being. And not that I'm special, but he, better than, and as a human, not just at the things he was good at. So he becomes 13 years old, uh, just before he turned 13 years old, he did it at 12 years old now, and he did a, what's called a hand and thigh deadlift, which means he lifted a barbell about an inch on the top end of a rack with 1,000 pounds. What? 12 years old. No at way. At 13, he becomes the youngest human being to ever bend a 60-penny nail. No at way. 14, he's crushing apples with his hands. What? He, can play, he could play nine musical instruments. At 13, he starts to become, become competitive in what's called sporting clay shooting, by 16, he's the state champion. By 16, he's also uh, one of the national level champions. He's a two-time All-American in sporting mm -hmm. plays. He becomes a high-level jiu-jitsu player. Uh, he, and he just becomes this amazing human being. And he, become, and he actually started in this shooting sport. And he, 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 to practice that, he started doing all these trick shots. And he could just pick up things and just uh, almost like magically do them, like in this weird way. Like he... Like he, he, his ability to just adapt and do all these things was this was just incredibly phenomenal. Um, for instance, to practice, he started shooting coins out of the air with a BB gun. Okay, mm. so he'd throw quarters in the air and shoot them out of the air with a BB gun. No way. Yeah. Well, and then it gets it gets crazier. So he starts with that to practice because the shooting sport's kind of expensive, and that's a cheap way to practice at home without having to go anywhere. And he's too young to do anything anywhere. So. <laughs> starts shooting so a guy recommends that to him so he starts doing it and he starts <laughs> shooting now, now it's not quarters it's now it's dimes and now <laughs> aspirin so what it's, it's aspirin and i actually have a video of him throwing a bb in the air and shooting a bb out of the air with another bb with no BB. ways yeah. wow one of those quarters he took one afternoon and he set up a mat so he could find it because when you hit the quarter, if you, if you don't use a very strong BB gun, it doesn't throw it very far. You can find it when you knock it out of the air. Mm. He shot that quarter 241 times out of the what? air in one afternoon. What? Wow. Destroy, it literally looks like a piece that you took a hammer and just beat. There's no face left. There's no, there's no writing of any. All it is is a beaten piece of metal now that you can wow. see. And so he becomes this just – uh, unbelievable human being he's a, uh, the youngest person to ever bend an iron mine red nail 15 years old he's the youngest person to have a piece of steel put in the physical culture museum in austin texas because he was bending pieces of steel that he was the youngest person to ever bend the goliath bar which is a four foot long uh half inch thick one and a half inch wide piece of steel it's like eight or ten pounds of steel it's ridiculous it took me years to be able to bend it he bent it at like 16 no ways. And he's not, he doesn't look like me either. There's the other thing. He's unassumingly phenomenal. So he was kind of big when he was 13, but then he got into jujitsu and became amazingly strong and became, and became, but he got some very thin, got very lean. So at, at his prime, he was a 6'2 and about 185, 190 pounds. Not, wow. not what you would think of. You, you look at me and you do, what do you do? You're a strong yeah. man. I'm not surprised. <clears throat> yeah. You, look at him, you don't notice those things. If you look at, you know, you look at him and do, and you don't see the other stuff that he is able to do and the other stuff that he does. And, and, and I'll tell you some other as a physical feats, and then I'll move on to why he was really special as a human being. Uh, so we got into these strength endurance feats. So, you know what a wall sit is? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wall sit, you know, what, you know, where yeah. you sit without it and you're back against the wall. Yeah. yeah. He held a 200 pound log on his legs in a wall sit for 30 continuous minutes. No way. Out of the position. What? <laughs> so his ability yes. to focus on both the most incredibly minute things as well as the ability to focus for long periods of time and just absolutely stay in the middle of a task and stay in the middle mm. of something that's that's one of the most painful feats I've ever seen. It's one of the most painful things I've ever tried. Wow. I mean it's just it's freakish the amount of pain. Jesus. And he just decided to be able to do that. And, and one of the things we did because we had the chance, ability to homeschool him and because I hang out with some of these strong guys is we tried our best to put him around the most phenomenal human beings on the planet as much as possible. So some of the strongest guys to ever walk this planet, he was six and seven years old and he calls them uncle. Huh. 
know, uncle this, uncle, uh, you know, okay, Dennis Rogers, he called him uncle Dennis, that kind of thing, you know, wow. him, that kind of thing. And he becomes this physical, just absolute giant. But more than that, he became a human being who was incredibly committed to helping other people. Um, mm -hmm. Shortly before he was killed, there was a hurricane here. And uh, he, it was the biggest hurricane to hit Florida in 25 or 30 years. And to help the people in our lives, we split up and I stayed with my mom and dad, my, with my mom and my wife stayed with her mom and dad. And he went and stayed with his girlfriend, grandparent, mother, who was much older. Hmm. And we got called when he, when he actually went to the funeral, we got a, a messages from people about what happened after that funeral that knocked down trees in their neighborhood and ambulances couldn't get in. And he had ridden his motorcycle over their neighborhood. And as soon as it was over, he took that motorcycle and drove out of the neighborhood and drove around and cut trees off of the road hmm. and moved them out of the road so that the ambulances could get in and, and help the people and, and never said a word. We didn't wow. know about that wow. until months after he passed away. No way. Until, until months after it happened and until shortly after he passed That's away. That's incredible. So, so what happened was, um, and he worked with all these, and he, he garnered respect because he gave respect. To people so he had like we got messages from people all over the world and we got a ton of important messages from people police officers and military people who he just happened to work with at the shooting range who knew him and he was just a kid he was only 21 years old but they respected him like he was a grown adult because of the way he treated them hmm. and so here's why how noah's army happened and noah's army came about and, and the story behind that he uh, we had been at a birthday party and he just happened to be riding his motorcycle and through a freak accident, a truck hit him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened October 2nd. And he was on life support basically until October 4th. And then they basically at that point told us that there, there is no recovery that he mm -hmm. is um, the, what they call brain death is there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he had become a, an organ donor and he'd become an organ donor at 16 because when my wife took him to get his driver's license, they asked him and, and he said, well, what's that? What does that mean? And she explained it to him and he said, well, why in the world? Why, why would you not help? Why, why would you not help somebody else? Why would mm -hmm. you not do? Why, why would you do that? Why would you go to your grave when you could give your heart to someone who, and somebody got to get to live because mm -hmm. you could give it to him. So we honored his wishes and made that happen. And the term Noah's army comes from this. So that's a Wednesday night. And when that happens, when your organ donation happens, as soon as they establish that this is going to happen, they go into a round the clock, get it done mode. Um, mm. the, the people who coordinate that because they have to find what you can possibly donate and who can have it and how, who can they get it to. And they have to go through all these channels and lists and they literally work round the clock until it's done. Hmm. to get wow. somebody a heart or get somebody a kidney or get somebody or to be able to do what it takes to do that. So Friday at 2 a.m. is when they've got everything worked out. They've got everything established. They know who's going to get what. They know what's going to happen. And that's the end. And that's when they take him from the hospital room he was in to the actual surgery to take the organs hmm. and do all of that. So we didn't know. And you, you won't know when that happens until like a few hours ahead of time, uh, like maybe, maybe five, six o'clock that night, they, they told us, okay, we've got everything set. We've scheduled the surgery for two o'clock. You know, what's going to happen. Hmm. And when we left that hospital room, there were 50 people hmm. standing in a line, 50 police officers, 50 military veterans who came and stood in an honor guard, on both sides of the hallway while they walked him out. Oh, it was enough God. people that it stopped traffic in wow. the hospital that people had to stop and ask who in the world, what is happening? Why are there so many people? We didn't call them. Just some of his friends knew. <laughs> and it looked when I glanced back, the term came from this. It, it just looked like an army hmm. of people. Wow. And so because of that, and because the only way to get past this kind of thing, 
to me because this is the kind of thing that as a parent can drive you insane or even kill you is to do something positive out of it. And so he was committed to being a police officer. He'd already signed himself up. He'd already, already set up to be in the police academy. And he'd refused to take money from us. He refused. To, we, we wanted to pay for it. The sheriff wanted to pay for it. And he refused to take money from anybody. He wanted to pay for it himself. Wow. And so what we decided to do is because he was committed to helping people. And, and, and after his death, we got story after story of people who showed up. He's like, you know what? I don't even, I didn't know him from Adam. And he stopped and helped me. And I didn't know him from Adam. And he cut the tree down in my yard that, that that get the ambulance in there and i didn't know him from from anywhere and people just randomly came to us and told us these things and we we had no idea we had no idea he never said a word and what we decided to do and, and and felt necessary to do was try to continue on the things he wanted and so he we wanted to help people become police officers and, and, and first responders and we, we set up a program to help uh, abused women get out of bad situations and elderly people and children in hospitals and to spread music to them because that was a big thing for him is to be able to help kids with music. And you know what, man, the things that happened after his death were just even more incredible because we didn't ask, but the sheriff in our town was at first, he posthumously made him a police officer. Hmm. First time so in the history wonderful. of Florida that it's been ever, ever been done. Wow. Uh, he spoke at his funeral and, and, and we had no idea what was happening. And wow. the, the jujitsu with posthumously made him a black belt. And he was honored by the Old Time Strongman Association by with a moment of silence, and he, and wow. just all of these things that he committed to doing in his life kept going after he was gone. <laughs> and we intended right. to to make that any part we could have in it. We didn't cause a lot of that, but any part we can have in it to make it a reality, we're going to do. And so we have fundraisers and different things every year, and that's our, our charity to continue his life's work into helping people in whatever way we can. And well, but the only I way mean, a tragedy like that is to do. It's the only way it's the only, it's the only way for us. It's the only way to, to continue to live and to continue to have a viable existence as a human being and go on and, and have some semblance of life. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I was just full of, uh, of goosebumps actually just listening to that story. It's one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. Like, He's only 21 and to have such a legacy and have touched so many people. And it's just amazing to see what's a, what is possible in a life, isn't it? And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just mind blowing actually. So, so thank you for sharing that. It just, just raises the, the kind of thinking that's possible for us all, you know, when you hear stories like this and it's so inspiring and, and thanks for turning it into a positive, you know, like I think there's so many lessons there and, and actually four people actually alive today, if, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, more than of, that. actually it's more because yeah. we found out some things I did, we had no idea. You know, I didn't know. And I, I, now some other countries have um, what they call default donation. So in other words, you're just, if you're, if you die, they take your organs and that's not, that's how it is. But America has opt in donation and, mm. and you actually have to register. Not just, it's not just on your driver's license. It's not as simple as it thinks because whoever happens to be standing there has the choice whether they honor your wishes unless you register and then your wishes have to be honored. But we found out other things and this was even more amazing. So four people that night directly, directly that night were hmm. given life because of him. And we met, uh, we met the man who got his heart, um, which is an amazing, absolutely amazing thing. And he was, he was not long, he, he would not have lived another month or two if he had not gotten <laughs> his heart and he would never have seen his grandchildren or never have seen his, his last grandchildren born. He'd never been able to be with his family. And that was an amazing thing for him to be, you know, and, um, and it was very fitting to Noah to be able to, that was the man he saved. Um, but we found out this too, that I didn't know. So what we did is a full donation. Okay. That means anything they can take from your body to help somebody else live, they will take. Okay. Mm. So they, those four internal organs are the people who got that that night. But what you don't know, also don't know is like, they'll often take pieces of the valves in your heart and they will actually make small valves or make pieces of hearts for babies that get no transplanted into babies. Hmm. They'll take bone marrow or bone um, grafts. And like, mm. we basically found out that a couple of babies got pieces of hearts. We found out that 
some veterans and some other people who are waiting on bone grafts and waiting on, on marrow and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Got, got that from that. I mean, there, and there's, and there, that they actually do, so they can set up to do like, like, um, tissue research testing to save people in the future. Um, there's a lot yeah. more to it than you think. And the, and the four people for that night and then more continuing throughout. Wow. Wow. Sounds like such an amazing young man. And it's just beautiful to hear how many people he's carried on helping since he passed away. Um, yeah, very, very touching, but I was super emotional just listening to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's amazing what you're doing as well, just carrying this on. So, so thanks so much for that, bud. Um, well, thank you. And like I said, it, you know what you, we all have choices and, and I, you know, you, you really don't understand this until you get in the middle of something like this. And, you know, I never, I, I, I always had empathy for people in situations, but I never truly understood it until mm. you're in something like that. And I never truly understood that there is an emotional there is an emotional damage that you can take from something like this that could literally drive you to insanity or could literally kill you. Mm. And I'm not talking about, I'm literally, it could take you to, we, my wife had joined a follows a grief support group online mm. and it's actually kind of crazy how many of the people end up committing suicide wow. out of grief from a loved one. And uh, if you don't find something positive to do out of the negative in your life, you, 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 I don't understand how you can keep going. I don't understand mm -hmm. how you can't, unless you find something to do to make it into something good. And you can, okay? You absolutely can. You, this is even the hard. There are days when this is unbearably hard, mm -hmm. but it's better when you see the good come out of it. Yeah. It's better when you, when you make the good come out of it. When you don't just sit back and allow it to happen to you, but you make the situation into what it could be and what it should be because if it has to happen at least we can we can still carry on and we can do the things yeah. that we wanted and we can do the things that will help other people and you can do that you just have to you have to force it to happen and that's not easy some days that's yeah. getting up when you don't want to get up yeah but the more you train your whole life to do that the better you'll be at everything and the better you'll be able to survive a, something like this yeah. And, and, and how, Liz, your, how do you and your wife support each other? Like, you know, does she, she's all involved in it too, or like, um, you know, how, well, how do you, yeah. She's the backbone of everything in my life. Mm. And she is the, the, she is the backbone of that because she's like a billion percent smarter than basically every human I know. So she runs all the, she does all the, computer work, all the paperwork, all the design work and all the stuff. And I carry all the heavy things around and that's pretty much how that works. <laughs> um, we are committed to doing anything. I don't care what it is. We will do anything to help each other. It just doesn't, that's just how it is. That's going to be, and, and it now, and I will say this, that was before this. Mm. I don't think you're, I don't think you should be married to each other if you won't do anything for each other, if you won't bend over backwards to help each other, if you won't do, I have friends now who I've listened to their live story about their marriages or their marriages coming apart. And because the man didn't love her, he's not, he, you don't love her if you're not willing to do anything for her. You just don't. That's just the truth. That's the hard way to look at it, but that's the truth. And we'll do absolutely anything. And sometimes within the situation we're in, that's trying to be okay for each other when one of us is out of our mind mm -hmm. and doing whatever it takes to help that. And some days that's, I need to carry all the boxes and some days that's you need to make sure I don't kill the neighbor. And some days that's, uh, I'll bring you home Reese's cups because that might make you happy. And some yeah. days that's, uh, you know, uh, and some days that's we need to sit together and just be quiet and cry. And some days that's just, um, the reality is it, but part of the reason we're doing well with this is because we have a lifetime of practicing how we treat each other, yeah. of practicing how we are with each other, of not being, no matter how crazy the moment is, not being vicious to each other, mm. not being, mm. no matter how bad, no matter how, and I'm, and okay, and I'm a never toward her, but I'm a, 
lit up human being. I'm, my emotions mm. are on – my whole life, is the volume is turned up to 10 all the time. <laughs> I've always been that way. That's the way I approach everything in lifting. That's the way I approach everything when I do everything. And that's the way I react emotionally to absolutely everything. And she's the calm, you know, like I said, keeps me from burning down the villages thing. But we have a lifetime of no matter what, you don't say vicious things to each other. You don't hurt each other. You don't do that. You take care of each other. You, I'll do anything, absolutely anything to make her okay, as, as okay as I can. And she do the same for me. And that's, you, 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 your relationship is not what it should be if that's not how it is between the both of you. And it has to be both ways. And yeah. if you don't practice that, you're, yeah, and, and people give up the mm. possible fairy tale of what they could have. Yeah. I had a friend who said to me that recently, I never thought I'd, it, it was even possible to have the fairy tale of life, of love. Of, of, I thought that was just all myth that nobody could ever have those relationships like that. You have to find the person who you truly do love that way, who you're meant to be with. But at the same time, you have to do it. You have to be mm. what it takes to be with that for that person. And that means loving like you are, like there is no barrier, like it is wide open. Like, and maybe it's just because that part of my head is broken and I have no governor. I have no, I have no breaks, <laughs> that kind of thing. But if you don't passionately love that person, like it is life and death, you don't need to be with them. And you don't need to, and you need to create the life where even if a bomb goes off, like it did in ours, you can take care of each other and do, and, and, and I don't care. I'm getting a sign from her right now. She's just standing on the other side of the room writing notes to me, telling me. <laughs> 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 she wrote, love you, Gomez, because we have a joke about being the Adams family couple. Of that, about, <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> about being Morticia and Gomez. And we've been married 24 years and still kiss each other in public and make people feel uncomfortable. And that kind of <laughs> <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't do that, if you don't make that happen. And, and here's the thing. Okay. Most people are living with these stupid barriers. I, I, I'm kind of bashful to hold her hand in public. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Act like you own the place you are and do mm. what you want. Be what you want. Act like you actually have authority in your own life mm. and, and do it and make it. And, and you know what? Uh, well, I'm just not that interested. Well, freaking find the thing that makes you salivate passionately and live that way. Yeah. And, even if you got to get a concussion to make it happen, I don't care what it happens. I, I, just do it. Don't be just, seriously. What are we doing that's wasting life? Why, why are we not living in a way that? Why are you accepting less than that in a marriage, in your physical training, in your job, in your in your moment to moment life? You have a short time on this planet, and you can make it the most amazing story that anybody around you has ever heard. You can make it the most interesting thing because I'm sorry, if you're bored, it's your freaking fault. <laughs> if, it's, if you're bored with life, you got to find better things to do. You got to yeah. make it happen. You, if you can't, you can't sit on the couch and complain about being bored. You, if you don't open the doors to living with each other like that, number one, you'll never survive a tragedy like with us, yeah. like the <laughs> thing that happened to us. And number two, you, why would you go through life with someone you didn't love that way? And why would you go through someone? Why would you exist? for 70 years and that's all you got well i did i had a pretty good time existing jesus yeah don't <laughs> the opportunities of life are yeah. so vast are so amazing are so beyond what's possible why would you not experience the incredibleness that life is emotionally physically and every other way mm. if you just open the door stop being afraid stop just do it and it's you know what you might get hurt a little bit along the way. Mm -hmm. You might, you, it's going to hurt. You might, it's, it's going to happen. You might have to do some really hard work, both emotionally, spiritually, physically. You actually are going to have to for sure do some physically if you're going to be vital enough mm. to do that. Because most people aren't experiencing any of those emotional massive benefits because they don't feel good enough to do anything. Yeah. I want to feel like there's fire in my veins all the time. So I train my bot like <laughs> I just got another sign from her but <laughs> <laughs> all the time, all the time. It, it's, and here's the thing. It's there in you. 
So you got to cultivate it. You got to throw the gasoline on it, do whatever it takes, spend the time that you have in the things that explode your imagination and, and find the way in your mate to be exploded with her and to be, uh, mm-hmm. to be in that in the way that you physically do things and the way that you, that you read and learn and function and, and, and live and play and all those things. Just find it. It's there. You just have to open the door. You have to turn the volume up, knock the barriers out, whatever it is. Stop being embarrassed that you, you know, I, listen, I realize that I, people watch me and they're like, that guy is nuts. He looked crazy. <laughs> I flat don't care. I'm having so much more fun and I'm living so much more powerfully than most of you. You can make fun of me all you freaking want. If you had any idea the level of passion existing in my life from moment to moment, hmm. you'd stop laughing and jump into my shit. Yeah. Super powerful, man. That's definitely a drop the mic. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. Right there. <laughs> I've got, we've got 10 minutes of video here that's going to go viral. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Hope so. You go, so, Craig. So, yeah, well, I mean, but maybe you can, you know, you're talking about you being so present and so passionate. Maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how life actually looks for you right now and living on the farm and, 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 and actually what sort of work that you're doing? Well, we're kind of transitioning work-wise. I split time. So I, I have a website and we sell the books and videos. And I actually have, I'm in the process of finishing two new books. Um, and I will always do some type of a teaching book, information, video. I, I find that the same thing as the live shows. Uh, for strong man, I, I, I'm just built to do that. That's if that makes sense. I'm built to, to communicate, to think that way. That's like a, that's a, like a life purpose thing for me. I don't do as much of the live shows as I, as I did. Um, because I don't, I still occasionally do them. I don't pursue it as a full time thing anymore. I'm more than willing to happily do them. Um, I just don't, I, I don't want to be gone that much anymore I'm, I'm, i would never take a full-time tour again I, I would i might do a week or two here and there or you know just come in and do something that kind of thing i still love to do live perform i just i don't want to be that i don't want to be that far away from my wife ever again or that far away from mm. um it, and day to day is you know for me uh <laughs> day to day is i have tried my best to set up my life to make it the way that my mind and body and spirit want to live, if that makes sense. So mm. I'm terrible about following clocks. I'm, I have no, maybe that's one of the pieces of my brain that's broken. I have no time, I have no, no sense of, because, uh, and, and here's another you know, theory thought on some of these things. We, we live existent by clocks in other people's schedules on things we really don't want to do on things that we really don't care about on things that really don't have no importance and things that have no time based eternal importance that have no, that in three years, I won't remember that I was five minutes late for this, that, or whatever. Plus I used to make this joke about whatever time I live on is strongman time. So it's basically what time I say it is when I get there. (laughs) Um, And some of that has to do with, you know what, creating authority in your own life. So I, I totally want to be respectful to other people's schedules and that kind of thing. But at the same time, I'm, I have things, the things that I create have enough value that I will, I will own my time. I will make Mm. things under my time. That is how it's going to work. I I refuse to accept a different way about that. Um, So in that, uh, you know, generally that's uh, uh, wake up coffee and then go about the day and that day that might, that usually in the early morning and the well, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not an early morning person. I'm a late night owl. So I tend to do whatever that kind of thing. So I sleep till I'm good and ready. I get up and then I work out and uh, walk my dogs and chase my wife around for a little bit and and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, And then whatever work happens to be throughout the day. So now we're in the process of rebuilding a farm that's been in my family for 160 years that we were just able to acquire the property. Um, So we're now sole owners of the property and able to sort of, and that was a dream of my, my, grandfather and father and my son was to be able to to actually exclusively own this and rebuild it into what it really once was my grandfather my grandfather was kind of an amazing guy his father died when he was 12 years old 
and he took care of five brothers and sisters from the time he was 12 wow. until wow. he was 80. Wow. And he hand planted every bit of the, the farm and stuff that's here. And then after his death, uh, there was a lot of kind of, you know, turmoil about who was going to get whatever of all the, well, now, now it's ours and now it's being rebuilt into the farm that we want. And I'm splitting the time in life amongst the things that I really want to do, which is information and building and teaching and that kind of thing. And some of it's live shows and some of it's books and videos and I'm expanding into different things because I, I've always, people have known me as this muscle headed, you know, muscle guy, but I want to be a lot more broader in the definitions of life and, and passions and that kind of thing. Um, We'll have at least two businesses related to this property, um, depending on how they function and depending on whatever. And it's, right now, it's kind of an experiment on what's the best crops and what's the best things to do and what's the best um, that kind of thing. And uh, then we are also spending a lot of time based around our charity, um, mm -hmm. based around you know either fundraisers or, or actually doing the work in relation to that. Well, one of the things we'd like to expand on is uh, we have a hopefully a potential program for, for helping to build um, people who need um, that are like people who've been in motorcycle accidents or people who've been in uh, a paralytic accident who need their house remodeled. Um, mm. Like for instance, a, a wheelchair ramp or that kind of thing put in where we're trying to expand into that particular thing. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, HBO will see this and we'll see that me throwing axes at stuff and find out that, uh, you know, I'm 45 years old and I'm better at 25 than I was at 45. And I probably have, you know, lift heavier things and have more sex and drink more bourbon and do more than basically everybody else on the planet. So, the other side of the room. <laughs> She's shaking her head, saying, "Oh, well, it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> I can't believe that in public to the oh my god, these people. Are there, they're, 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 yeah, you're I, I'll you're tell you why I said that because for me, everything I talk to you about about living under a passionate level fl fleshes out into the food you eat into the sex you have into the relationships you do you have into the, the the way you adjust with other people the way you work the what mm. you work on the way you spend those time the way you approach your time with other people the way you approach your time in what you're willing to give or what you're willing to allow all of that fleshes out into the same thing it's all mm. into the process of building yourself into the most amazing human being you can be and and you have to have control or take control or as much as is possible within every bit of those things and not let yourself off the hook, not let yourself off the, you know what I'm saying? Not let yourself off the, I don't really believe in living under a complete pressured situation all the time. And most of us live that way. We, mm. You know, we're worried, we're bored or hate our nine to five job. And we do that. And we, because we don't create any other option. Well, you have to create your own options. You have to take that control of the moment to moment of your life and make it the happiest, craziest, most interesting you can possibly make it. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that's me riding around on a tractor and sometimes that's me lifting crazy things in the yard and scaring the neighbors because I'm throwing a burning ax at something <laughs> in the air. And um, sometimes it's me writing and that kind of thing as well. So uh, maybe that fleshes out some of the day to day. So, yeah. so, but I just like, you know, people are going to listen to this and they're going to go, cool, it's all fair and well that you say that, you know, you've got to go and do what you want and all these things. But then everyone will come up with like every single under, excuse under the sun, basically, you know, saying, oh, it's easy, you know, easy for you because you've got blah, blah, blah. And for me, it's more difficult because I've got a family and I've got to feed them. And it's like, what, what do you say to people that say that or come up with excuses like that? I'll tell you this. I started without a dime, dirt poor, uh, and st never was really, my family was, my, my grandfather started literally with nothing. I mean, literally as a 12 year old taking care of, my, and my, you know, and so my parents were middle class. I never really had super struggle, but in the same, I never really had any real money and that kind of thing. I never really had any real, and never had any, because of the, the my grandparents came up in the depression era and the, that kind of mentality of you have to do you have to, you can't take chances. You have to do the safe way kind of flowed through. And I just never was able to do it, but I'll tell you what it is. And sometimes, okay. I didn't just tell you the easy thing. What you see is the easy thing at the end. What you see is the end result of 20 something years of me creating a life, not the five minutes. Cause you're going to see that crap all over the internet. Just do this. And five minutes you'll be million and blah, 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 mm. blah, blah, blah. That's a freaking lie. I know some of those people up in person 
and I know how they actually got that way. And it was more work than most people are ever willing to, to do. Yeah. You want to create a life? You Okay. W what I haven't talked about is that w we got married. I wanted her to stay home with our, with our child. Uh, I worked 80 to a hundred hours a week for a long mm -hmm. time at two different jobs. The first time I squatted 800 pounds was at three in the morning outside on a construction site. I was working an extra job doing security. No ways. You, you, don't, you, you, you have to be willing to do extraordinary things if you want to create extraordinary things. And you have to be willing to not take excuses. You got a family you got to support? Wonderful. Do it. Do what it takes. If that takes working extra hours, and it may take a short time period of working extraordinarily hard to create a longer period where you have more time yeah, yeah. where you where you have more control where you have more yeah you may not have it and it may take doing the thing you're scared of stop what you're doing and go back to school or if or mm -hmm. don't go to school or create the business you want or keep working at that job and create that business on the side or it, i'm not in any way ever gonna that was one of the things i probably will write about at some point is <laughs> the honest the honest truth about creating a real life and making money because the reality is it's never what everybody who sells that is just do this and work four hours and blah, 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 blah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's not the reality is now at some point, the goal is to get to that spot where you have control, but along the way, you're going to make a bunch of sacrifices. You're going to do a lot of work. Okay. Excuses, uh, crushed hip, fractured skull, multiple yeah. concussions, shouldn't walk, tons of pain. Never came from a bunch of money. Uh, couldn't live the other way people live, so I forced myself to live in a way that made work for us. Worked eighty to a hundred hours a week. Uh, had a family to support. Um, had businesses that thrived and then basically failed and had to rebuild the whole thing again. Uh, had a bomb go off in my life and nearly totally emotionally crippled myself and my wife. Uh, have had you got better excuses than that? Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't have better excuses than that. Mm. Nobody has an excuse that holds water. You know what? I, I get it. Everybody has a hard time. Everybody has problems. Right. I, I'm no, not in any way invalidating that. I realize that the question is, are you willing to get past them? And it's not that you can't, uh, there are stories all over the world, millions of stories of people who, did whatever it took to get what they wanted, uh, no matter what the excuses were, no matter what the problems were. Um, you just have to be stronger than your excuses. And you yeah. have to, it has to mean more to you than whatever the hardship it is that you got to go through to get there. It's so powerful. I think, yeah, it's so easy to fall into that trap, isn't it? it, it you can oh, literally absolutely. justify anything in your life with with something else you can always make our brains are very good at creating these stories and these narratives and uh, so it's, it's just such a good reminder but talking about strength in and creating strength right you you you're physically very strong you're mentally very strong but they're not that different um and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about why why creating this physical presence this physical strength um, and body strength can also then connect to a mental strength and a, and a sort of a, an improvement in your life, in your life as a whole. Cause I think that's a, some of the message that you kind of spread. Your physical strength long-term is determined by your mental strength, but building mental strength is optimally achieved by physical exertion. Okay. Uh, the strongest guys on the planet, aren't the strongest guys necessarily because they're the most talented and it was the easiest for them to get there is because they're the most hard nosed, mentally focused, mentally tough guys who gutted through what it took to get there. And people talk about, I'm going to build myself up mentally. You know what the easiest, fastest, simplest way to do that is work till your work till you can't see straight with your body, because that is the combination of focus of things together. And, and I think we're incomplete without both. Okay. If you're, first of all, you won't get physically strong if you don't learn to focus. It's just not going to happen. But the fastest way to learn to truly focus, to truly get mentally together, is to put yourself in a situation where you absolutely, everything else fades away. I have a friend who, a guy I coach occasionally, and a friend who has talked about some of my stuff as an iron meditation. 
okay, <laughs> as a uh, meaning that uh, what monks are trying to achieve in that Zen-like state and that nothing else is existing. You know what the fastest way to that is? Spend 30 seconds with the heaviest barbell you can possibly stand, heavier than you mm. thought possible on your back. <laughs> absolutely everything will fade completely away. And that's a skill. That's a skill you can have that then can be taken into uh, uh, when I'm writing or when I'm doing this or when I'm focusing on that or when I'm doing all that together. And your body and mind need to function together. Now, if your, bo if your leg is broken, does that mean you're suddenly not useful as a human being? And you get, no, it, uh, no, your mind is the driving force of absolutely everything. Your mind mm -hmm. and your spirit. Uh, you know, come together, your, I believe your connection to God, all those things are your driving forces all together. But why not take the vehicle you have and give it the vitality to actually want to do those things? So a lot of people are going to say, you were talking about the excuses, okay? Oh, I'd love to do that, but I'm tired. Well, you know what? You know how to fix being tired, get healthier. Mm -hmm. You know how to fix mm -hmm. being tired, work out. Because your body doesn't get more tired from working out. Your body actually creates another drive of energy of possibility you want to have the ability to live like you're literally going 100 miles an hour and on fire all the time you have to create the hormonal environment for that to happen you have to create mm. the physical vitality and you do that by getting in tremendous aerobic shape you do that by getting physically strong most people are 10 pounds strong they're they're strong enough to live their life by 10 pounds and that's why they're hurt and why, that's why they're lousy all the time. If the exertion of their life on a just off-handed scale takes 100 pounds, their possible creation of, of energy, of strength, of all that is 110 pounds. And then when life requires 120 pounds and it's an unusual circumstance, they're exhausted, they're tired, they're hurt. Hmm. Why not, with the little bit of effort it takes, build a body that's literally made out of steel it doesn't take that much time it does take effort but it doesn't take that much time and build a body that that represents your day-to-day -day as easy not as a drag not as crushing not as i get home from work and i don't have the energy to get off the couch because your body isn't in freaking good enough shape to survive mm -hmm. your day you're just barely strong enough to get by well, why not take that and make it where you do have the energy, you do have the vitality, you do have the strength, because with it just a little ton of work, instead of your body having a maximum capacity of 110 pounds, you'll have 500 pounds. And your average day isn't going to require more than that 100 pounds. But you have the vitality to survive anything, any day, no matter what life throws at you. And because of that, you have the reserves of vital energy mm. to be able to do the, to, to not take excuses, to not... If you felt better, if you felt lively all the time, if you felt like you were on fire, like your veins were coursing with life and energy all the time, wouldn't you want to actually do stuff? Hmm. Well, the only way to get there is to take the body you ride around in and make it the best it can possibly be. And by their doing, you open the mind because the mind and body intimately work together. And if you use that vitality of the body and you use that difficulty of effort, to build that mental strength. Well, then, you know what? When you're in an office meeting and you've got to pay attention for 30 more minutes than you really want to, you can do it. Or when you've hmm. got to suck it up and get off the couch and do something to make your wife and kids happy, or when you've got to suck it up and do that extra thing to build your business that's uh, 10 more hours that day than you wanted to put in, um, you're okay to do it. The, the, what people miss is that is they think, you know, oh, this guy's mentally tough. You know why that guy's mentally tough? Because that guy spent a ton of time making his mind mm -hmm. endure things because he used his body to do it. And what I alluded to before, your mind grows with your body, especially mm -hmm. if you throw an educational component and an emotional and spiritual component into what you're doing, into not just focusing on the task at hand, but focusing on what you want, or focusing on building that that peacefulness or that passionateness or that whatever else mm. into what you're doing all of this is practice is practical practiced meditation practical practiced psychological conditioning if you mm. psychologically condition yourself that this is not even okay something i talk to people on a regular time about i see people come work out with me and they're like oh this hurts so bad i'm like that's not pain <laughs> they're like, what do you mean it's not pain it's not pain Pain is if I take this axe that I'm throwing at the target and stab you in the leg with it. That's <laughs> okay. Lactic acid burn because I ask you to do a hundred snatches. It's not pain. It's effort. It's re 
designing your mental thought on what what on what effort and pain and reality Mm -hmm. and redesigning the paradigm inside your head on on what that is and and on what the 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 openness of life is that's possible if you just take that you just put it all together and and i think the body is the perfect easiest fastest way to literally open your mind open your spirit to all those things and to condition yourself okay I think everybody ought to exercise. I don't care whether you're big, small, lose weight, overweight. I don't give a crap about it. Not for that reason. For the reason that you need to be strong enough to do anything you want. You need to be in shape enough to do anything you want. I don't care what you look like. What I care about is how you perform. And I care about how it affects your happiness and your, your ability to live the life you want and help other people. Okay? If you do that in a way that constantly reinforces positivity, constantly reinforces uh, your uh, your mindset of I can do anything constantly reinforces a, a mindset of happiness, of peacefulness, of love, of power, of getting it done, of invincibility even. Okay, not, and not in a, a stupid false way, but in, in an invincibility mm. to, dude, uh, 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 the, uh, the common cold is not going to kill me. I'm not even going to yeah. catch it. I'm going to crush the cold and walk right by and do what I want to do. That, <laughs> see what I mean? That 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 kind of I'm not going to live in a way that I'm frightened of absolutely everything because every day. Just like when you brush your teeth, I'm, every day when I exercise, that's mental building and it's reinforced every day, every day, every day, every day, all the time. Not because I need to get bigger, not because I need, because that is the more important part of that. Who cares how big I am if my mind and everything functions better and if I can live the way I want to live because I spend that time. Physical conditioning is mental conditioning, mm-hmm. especially if it's conscious and thought about and practiced and done right. Yeah. definitely yeah De- yeah reminds me of david goggins he keeps on talking about you got to callous the mind and like yeah. you know do that obviously he does it through physical stuff too and it's, it's so right but I like i think the two just go hand in hand for sure you know and it's uh, so important to make sure that you are physically strong and and uh, healthy because it just helps you in so many other parts of your life um, well and, and most people are like a lot of the people i work with right now are, are much older yeah. Okay. It, it, listen, if you don't, you will decline. Yeah, exactly. But, but if mm. you took a couple of workouts a week and give your body a reason not to decline, well, suddenly you're not only are you not declining, you're getting better. And if you're getting mm. better, guess what? You're getting younger. Yes. And you're getting younger and you're getting stronger and your life is getting better. And uh, why wouldn't you do that? Even if you don't like lifting weights, I don't care if you like lifting weights or not. Uh, you, don't like, you probably don't like getting the oil change in your car, but <laughs> mm. you don't. Yeah. Guess what? Car falls apart. Well, yeah. you have to. You have. To. It, it all depends on do you want to live or not. Yeah, yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, look, uh, but we're unfortunately coming to the end of this. We could chat to you forever. You're such a great guy. We're <laughs> spreading so much uh, wisdom. That's for sure. Um, but just before we finish off, uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about like what you're most excited about, about the future. If you've got anything else coming up, you mentioned your books and also how people can get in touch with you. Okay. So, uh, I have two books, uh, coming up. Uh, one is going to be called outlaw strength. And that's going to be about some of the crazy methods that I use that are just totally not, uh, the controversial methods towards mm-hmm. strength that I use uh, because I tend to do things that most people don't do. Um, but in doing so have gotten results most people don't get. So that's the, the whole idea of that. And it's really about things that people don't understand that, that, that there are methods that are hundred years old that people have been doing forever, even thousands of years old that can totally be what uh, that, that, that are scoffed at by the modern Instagram crowd. <laughs> yeah, that's, are working, doing phenomenal strength building for people that are, you know, that, that it's just because you don't understand the thing doesn't make it not valid. So this is about those things, the, the really crazy stuff. Um, the second book is actually about sex, which is a total departure. Uh, it's a crazy, <laughs> it's got an eye roll. From- <laughs> 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 just because, because of the, the total, you know, social media craziness I'm going to get by, about that. I, the, oh my God. I can't believe you're talking about that. Listen, man, that's one of the most fun things in all of life. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to be 
healthy enough and primally in touch with your nature enough to really be good at it and to be what you could be. And another one of the things I just had a conversation with somebody about is like, okay, most of the people who talk about that are pretty little model looking people and Mm. don't look like me. And here's one of the reasons I want to do it because I look like why, because the average human might not necessarily be big and muscular, but they look a lot more like me than they do like a Hollywood star. Okay. They look more like a normal person, you know? Um, And we're conditioned that only people who look pretty, only people who are famous, only people who are stellar can have an over the top life of, of a relationship or sex or money. Well, what if you could just sort of look normal and have absolutely stellar Mm. Yeah. life and sex and money and power and, and all the things that what if you absolutely what if it made no difference what if you literally believed that you were as deserving as anybody else to have every moment of life and passion and power and pleasure that people that you think are supposed to have are having hmm. uh, i think that's a thing i think that's a valid thing i think that's a message people need to have that yeah. you don't need to be any different um those are the two books. There will be, of course, accompanying videos, and and you'll always see me doing wacko stuff. <laughs> I really did get it. <laughs> yeah, big stuff. <laughs> um, uh, uh, there will be a accompanying, you know, obviously video or audio downloads. Be the <laughs> you'll always find me on Facebook. <laughs> I'm kind of committed to doing something crazy physically every day. I'd like to catalog over the course of my life a thousand different strength or physical feats of some sort which is why you see me pursuing every possible angle of of physicality of every possible from endurance to coordination to accuracy to uh strength to any com- possible combination of all those things you'll always see me doing stuff and generally half of it'll be about on fire uh, on my <laughs> instagram that kind of thing um you can find me under my name I, I, bud jeffries under on facebook or instagram uh, you can find our website, uh, www.anunconventionallife.com. And the point of that is it's about your whole life, about making it just absolutely amazing. You can also find official Noah's army dot org. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm so, so terrible with that kind of thing in my life. <laughs> uh, where you can donate to our charity or you can find out more things about that, about what the events we'll have and, and all that stuff. And then, you know, uh, Let's see, that covers pretty much where we are with that until I, you know, until HBO decides to make a documentary of, of how I lit my neighbor's fence on fire. Come on, HBO. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bud, we have one last question for you. And yes, the question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Okay. I think it means being ridiculously authentic in what you do not contriving under anybody else's social norm, not contriving under anybody else's idea of how you should be, not limiting yourself to what's normal, completely refusing to accept mediocrity in any area of your life and becoming the total potential of what you could be. And you absolutely have the ability to do it. It's just whether or not you're not, I think very few people will. I think very few people will, will actually man up to the challenge. Will actually, you can question is, will you, hmm. but being ridiculously human is maybe the biggest gift. If you look at the mythology of the, of the angels and, 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 and the things that we talk about where, uh, the, the, the fragileness of humanity maybe is our gift. The fragileness of humanity, the fact that we could die is the thing that makes us alive. Hmm. So every moment you have while you're here ought to be, a moment spent in building epicness. <laughs> I love it. It's <laughs> amazing, but such a great I answer. That was, <laughs> <laughs> was totally epic, but um, <laughs> wow, man! But uh, seriously, just a uh, like honestly, a massive thank you for uh, coming on our podcast. I'm just so happy that you've come into our lives, and uh, you know, you you the message that you spread is so powerful, and you've you've just reiterated for me like to to really go that layer deeper with myself and be seriously true about what I want to do and, and the difference that I want to make in the world and that it's flipping okay. Don't worry about what people think. And I think that is 
so powerful and, and more and more and more people should be doing that. Um, and thank you for just seriously being so vulnerable as well, like, and telling us these heart wrenching stories, but so powerful at the same time, you know, like I was really choking up just listening to you telling us about Noah and yeah, it's so difficult, but what you're doing is, and what you've done as a result is so amazing. And I'm sure there's so many people that are going to be able to listen to that and draw strength from it because it does happen to a lot of people, like you said, and that grief can really tear you apart and tear you down as a human. And if, if, if any of them can hear this talk and, and everything that you've shared, then you'll pull, you know, a few people out of that sort of mindset and, and give them a bit more hope. Um, you seriously are an amazing guy, bud. And, and I, I truly hope I, I get to meet you someday in person. And I come to uh, play on your farm barefoot and throw some weights around <laughs> what the story is because you've really, be touched, awesome. you really touched me, bud. And I, oh, I seriously... Thank you, Thank you so much for coming on the show. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank, um, you know, if anything I've been able to say is helpful, then I'm very happy. And thank you for having me. This has been, this has been fun. Pleasure. Man. And, and just real briefly from my side, but I'll just reiterate to keep it brief, exactly what Gareth said. There's just, there's too much value in this today to, to even know where to begin really. But one just small thing in my own personal life is that I actually went and registered to be an organ donor yesterday. And so did my wife. And, you know, just, that's just a small thing in our lives that has changed because we've met you and, oh, thank you. you know, to uh, go and do it. So, so thank you, you know, like, and thanks to Noah and your wife, like your, your message yeah. is just um, literally life changing, you know, so, so it, keep it up and um, just thank you for being super inspirational. There, there aren't enough people out there like you. So we really appreciate it. And loads of other people do, even the ones that you're not maybe hearing from, they're watching, they're listening, they're hearing. So uh, thank you once again. Thank you, sir. And again, cool. thank you both. Bless you both for being organ donors. That's just amazing. Thank you. Thanks, man. Pleasure. Cheers, man. Well, bud. <laughs> Breaking the dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.